Hello and welcome to this Institute of Economic Affairs Free Market Forum discussion on the Conservative Party leadership race. The next leader of the party will be either Rishi Sunak, the former Chancellor of the Exchequer, who was the preferred candidate for, for, of MPs during the parliamentary round, or Liz Truss, Foreign Secretary, who is, according to the polls, the favourite amongst members as of today. With inflation expected to top 10%, a tax burden that is the highest in 70 years, and a cost of living crisis, there are a lot of areas for the next Prime Minister, whosoever they may be, to institute radical free market reforms that our economy needs. But who is the most likely to deliver these free market policies? Over this and the second video, I'm delighted to be joined by two of our free market forum parliamentary supporters who will be putting the case for their preferred candidates. Today, I'm delighted to be joined by the Right Honourable Mark Harper, Member of Parliament for the Forest of Dean. Now, Mark, you've written a blog for the Free Market Forum website, which we will link to in the description below, yep. outlining your free market case for Rishi Sunak. But could you please give us a short praise of why Rishi should be the preferred candidate of free marketeers and why you've chosen to support him? Sure. Uh, home members can obviously look at the blog, so I won't just repeat that. I think, look, I think, first of all, he's the change candidate. So he's the candidate that I think will break with the way the government was being run um, under the present prime minister. I think it's important both for our chances of winning, but also I think of our chances of actually getting stuff done, that we need somebody there with grip, who's gonna be honest with both our members and voters about the challenges we face, so that you can then put together policy prescriptions that will actually deal with those challenges. So I think that's the first thing. Second thing, post COVID, uh, you want someone who's going to grapple with those economic challenges. And I think my view and the clear view of both voters, conservative voters and conservative members is inflation is the single biggest, is the priority for dealing with now ahead of tax cuts. Uh, and I think that's Rishi's plan. So it's not not doing tax cuts. It's just getting inflation sorted first, which was the Lawson Thatcher approach growing the economy uh, and then getting tax cuts that are sustainable delivered when you've effectively earned them. Uh, and I think this, this, the final thing I would say, just to do it in three, is I still remember um, when we were going through the pandemic, some people on this uh, listening to this will remember I chair the COVID recovery group. We were asking the tough questions of government uh, and Rishi was the senior person in government involved with those decisions. He was always making the case in government for challenging the status quo, asking the difficult questions and trying to be more balanced. And last winter, people will know that he came back from the US from a, a business trip um, where he was arguing for Britain, came back to make sure that we didn't put loads of restrictions in and lock down the country again. So I think for all of those reasons, he's the right choice for those people who believe in free markets. I just want to question you on one thing from what you, what you just said. You mentioned that Rishi is the change candidate. I'm just wondering, considering that he's been the chancellor for uh, the, at least the last, well, sorry, was the chancellor for two years and was working hand in glove with the prime minister. I'm just curious to hear why he's the more change candidate of the, uh, of the two, considering economic policy is going to be the big issue. Well, two, two things. First of all, um, as I think Simon Clark, the chief secretary to the Treasury, who's supporting Liz, said himself when he was challenged on uh, spending and, and tax, he made the point that uh, the tax uh, rises that the government had to put in place over the last couple of years were based on Boris Johnson's spending plans. Uh, and I think if Rishi Sunak was the prime minister rather than being the chancellor, he would be able to ask the tough questions on government spending that weren't able to be asked when Boris Johnson was prime minister. Boris Johnson was not somebody, as we know from what he said about the 2010-2015 parliament, whoever wanted to bear down on government spending. And long term, if you're going to keep taxes low, you have to do two things. You have to control public spending and grow the economy. You have to do both of those things. Mm -hmm. And I think Rishi can do both. Um, the, the second thing I'd say is, of course, the last couple of years, but practically all the time that he was chancellor was dominated by the COVID pandemic and the fallout from it, you know, and when he became chancellor, I think he demonstrated why he's the change candidate. He was a relatively new chancellor. He was faced with a massive economic shock when we, the government shut down, you know, whether you think that was right or wrong, shut down the economy. 
Lots of people were terrified about their jobs and businesses. He grabbed the treasury uh, through orthodoxy under the bus effectively and got the treasury to respond in a way that met the challenge that we were facing. And I think saved millions of jobs and thousands of businesses, but that does have some economic consequences and we can't pretend it doesn't. Mm. No, you're, I, I completely understand that. But the, so if he, if the argument is that Rishi Sunak is saying that we can't afford tax cuts at the moment, I think the question from a lot of free marketeers is why is there not an obvious path to shrinking the state, shrinking this amount of government spending in his manifesto? Uh, I think that, uh, I mean, I, for one at least, would be quite, I, I completely understand the arguments around sound money and I can, I think that you're right that Margaret Thatcher believed very strongly in balancing the books as much as she did on um, cutting taxes. But if that's the case, why is there no path towards less government spending or a smaller state? Rishi just seems to be happy to have the tax burden remain at the current level. Well, I'd say two things. First of all, he wants to reduce the tax burden, but he wants to do it when we've gripped inflation. And let, let me just give you an example. So if we look at the biggest difference between the candidates, which is what they've proposed on tax, mm -hmm. you know, everyone listening to this is going to know that there's a massive economic challenge facing us this winter. Energy prices are now going to be even higher than we thought they were going to be at the beginning of the year. And whatever people would like to be true, we have to, the Conservative Party has got to be rooted in reality. And there are millions of people in our country who are terrified that they're not going to be able to pay their energy bills over the winter, or if they pay their energy bills, not have any money left for anything else. And cutting taxes helps people a bit, people who pay taxes, doesn't help people. If you look at the NI rise, which Liz is proposing to reverse, does not help pensioners at all. And it delivers most help to people who earn the most. It will deliver the Prime Minister a £1,810 tax cut. It will deliver somebody working full time on the national living wage a £59 tax cut. That's per year. Now, it just that simply doesn't do what is required. It's an, a large unfunded tax cut, most of which goes to people that don't need the help. I think you're better off making a one off targeted intervention on those people that are going to need the help. Now, you can pretend people don't need the help all you like, but they do. The political reality is a Conservative government is going to help them, and you have to work out how that's best delivered. And I think uh, what Rishi has set out is sensible. Ruling out handouts, which is what Liz has done, is simply going to be politically unsustainable. If it was sustained, we wouldn't win the next election. What Rishi has set out on growth is important. Over the last 10 years, we've tested the experiment, do low corporation tax drive investment and growth? And the answer is, they don't, and they didn't. What Rishi has said is, let's put up corporation tax rates for the largest, most profitable companies, so it won't affect at the 70% of the smallest businesses in the country, which is partly to raise some money to deal with the pandemic. I think that's necessary but he's also said that you need to deliver business tax cuts that that benefit those businesses that invest in capital in people uh, and in uh, innovation that is how you drive investment that's where our tax system is less generous than the tax systems of countries that have a better productivity record so i think if you do that that's how we're going to get the economic growth just because in corporation tax is actually the failed economic orthodoxy which we've tried which hasn't been successful hmm. i think um the cutting rates is not the only way to reduce the overall tax burden as well there's also tax simplification which is something that uh, the institute of economic affairs has been arguing for for many years or other authors for have been arguing in ia publications so I was wondering, considering that Rishi's been inside the belly of the beast, if you will, he spent two years in the Treasury. He, I, I believe before that he was a, um, was he Chief Secretary to the Treasury before that, I think? He was for a period, yes. Yes. Um, and uh, so he's been inside the belly of the beast. Do you think that he has any intention of simplifying the tax system rather than just trying to cut rates over the longer term if he becomes Prime Minister? Yes, I do. I mean, I think his, his great, if you look at his, uh, the Chancellor, which he, he thinks is a great inspiration, is Nigel Lawson. And of course, that was exactly what Lawson did, which was 
reduce complexity, reduce rates, but you have to earn that. You can't do it uh, in an environment like we have now with high inflation. So I think that is the direction that Rishi wants to go in, is to simplify, to reduce rates, but you have to earn the ability to do that when you have dealt with inflation and when you've got us back on a growth path, uh, which you do through business tax cuts that drive investment in innovation. He's, he talks very, um, I think, passionately and knowledgeably about driving innovation. That's how we're going to both grow the economy faster, but also how we're going to deliver public services in an environment where demand is increasing, but without just pouring more and more money into them. And actually, one of the things he's talked about is having a more intelligent conversation with the public where we don't just focus on inputs, how much money we're putting into public services, but we focus on what we get out of them. And he's talked with the NHS about how you can grip dealing with backlogs, how you restructure things to have surgical hubs where you focus on doctors being able to do volume treatments without being pulled off of those to deal with A&E, how you structure it differently. And I think there's a, a lot of merit in looking at how we organise our public services. So we still deliver what people require, but we do it in a way that reduces the pressure on public spending. Otherwise, on the health service, you're going to end up with the health service crowding out important investment in things, for example, like education. Mm. No, absolutely. And I was uh, actually in the Sky News debate audience uh, last week when he was talking about uh, the importance of performing the National Health Service and uh, the um, the uh, the fine for not turning up to your uh, to your appointment. If you miss multiple appointments, you get charged for them, which um, is definitely an uh, interesting step in the right direction. But um, I want just, to just on that one, Sam. Oh, point yes. of, it's not a that's not a money raising exercise. Mm. That's about trying to change the culture so that you reduce missed appointments, you then free up capacity so that you deliver more treatment and more patients being able to be seen by clinicians, but without us having to spend more money on it because you stop capacity being wasted. So it's those sorts of things that are about, not about raising money, but they're about using the existing capacity more efficiently. And I think there's a lot of merit in Yes, yes. Well, quite. Uh, I suppose a question would be, though, does, is Rishi, and I, I hate the sort of, hell yes, I'm tough enough sort of moments and these type of things, but the reforming the National Health Service in any way, let alone putting anything that looks like any sort of charge on people accessing the NHS, even if it's a charge for people who've missed an appointment rather than using it. Do you think Rishi does will actually be able to carry through with these sort of policies? I mean, they seem like they're going to generate quite a lot of uh, pushback from the from the NHS, from a lot of the sort of third sector that uh, control that is very very loud in the media. Do you think he's actually able to going to be able to do these type of policies? Yes, because I think if you look at how you deliver successful policy change, it, it's not about who can shout loudest. It's about who does the work. It, it, prime ministers who get things done are people that are across the detail, understand the issue, have thought about the potential pitfalls, set out a clear, well-argued case, uh, and then are relentless in driving that through. And that's exactly what I saw him do when he was at the Treasury. And I saw, for example, in meetings that you know, the public won't have seen, when he was preparing for the various... Uh, interventions that he's delivered in the uh, energy um, system to help people through this energy crisis. And it was about meeting with colleagues, members of parliament, listening, uh, which is not always the skill politicians do, they tend to do more talking, less listening, lots of listening, um, understanding what problem colleagues were trying to solve, being across the detail and how all of the different aspects interact with each other and then coming up with a set of proposals which are well thought through you know don't fall apart on contact with the, the you know the world um, and have been very sustainable and actually if you look at what we've rolled out very big intervention i don't think anybody is now suggesting that they're not necessary um, we're probably going to have to go further because energy prices have risen further than we thought earlier in the year. But those proposals have been rolled out well. They've landed well, the different aspects of them. They've been, use that ghastly phrase, operationalised. So they've been turned from 
policy into reality. That's what you need. You need a prime minister who's across the detail and understands that to get something done, you've got to be you've got to be across the detail, understand how to do it. You can't just believe in it. You've got to have done the pre preparatory work to get it done. And then you've got to follow it through relentlessly. And I think somebody like that is exactly the sort of person to drive change through the health service, rather than somebody who hasn't thought these things through properly. To come back to inflation, the um, I saw that uh, Rishi today said, and you alluded to this before, that uh, he wanted COVID style economic measures um, as as response to the um, to the cost of living crisis, I'm curious as to what the argument is that major new spending commitments won't be won't make inflation worse, while Liz Truss's tax cuts will. It seems to me that they're both pumping money into the economy and potentially in making the debt worse. Unless, of course, Rishi's planning spending inc uh, tax increases to cover the cost of any additional spending pledges. Well, I think, first of all, he's obviously not going to be, he's keeping in place the tax changes that he's already made. So, um, you know, Liz is going to, said she's going to reverse the NI increase uh, and the corporation tax one. So that's over £30 billion pounds of, of uh, tax cuts uh, that are funded by borrowing. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, first of all, there's a big difference between permanent unfunded tax cuts that are going to be in existence each and every year, as opposed to one-off measures to deal with a specific crisis. Secondly, you also have to look at where the money gets spent. If you're focusing the support on people that are using that money to deal with the thing that is uh, of pressing uh, uh, urgency, so energy prices, for example, that is not going to have the same read across into the wider economy. But if you give very significant amounts of money, to other people who are not going to spend it on energy, but have that money available to spend on other things, particularly in areas where um, the economy is constrained. We've got a labour market shortage. That's the domestic supply shock that the governor of the Bank of England talked about. So putting lots of extra money into the system when you haven't got the ability for the system to respond is going to be inflationary, but particularly if it's a permanent change every year, as opposed to something that's very targeted and a of all this particular financial year. Okay. Um, I want to try and sort of tease out a few other policy areas rather than just on the economy. Um, I, uh, I heard Rishi talking about um, his plan to significantly increase the number of homes that are being built. I mean, obviously housing is going to be a huge issue for both the country and for the Conservative Party in particular, if over the longer term, uh, we're going to have a uh, property owning democracy. Um, What's Rishi's plans to increase the number of how, the number of houses being built, and do you think that will be enough to help bring prices well to stabilise prices at least? Well, couple of two separate questions. There. So on on building houses, I think he's been very clear that we want two things in urban areas and cities. It's being much smarter about building more densely. So there are lots of opportunities in urban areas for what's called densification, which is basically uh, in the land that you've got to build, you know, upwards um, and allow people, for example, to expand and put extra stories on and to build uh, higher rise properties. I think that makes a lot of sense. Um, and you can do that and increase supply in more rural areas. Uh, it's about making sure that you put the incentives in place so that local areas want to build the housing. We saw that a while ago, you know, when we had the new homes bonus where local authorities knew they were going to get the resources to deliver infrastructure and local services and so we're happy to build the houses if you if you don't have any kind of um, uh, central guidance at all uh, or any incentives then the evidence is a lot of parts of the country simply don't build any houses and you therefore lock a whole generation of people out of the um, uh, out of owning their own homes Part of it also is on finance. So one of the big things is lots of people can afford uh, the mortgage repayments. What they don't have, unless they have a significant legacy, is the money for a deposit. And I think therefore you do need some work on finance. And obviously he did that when he was at the Treasury with things like Help to Buy and its successor for first time bars where you enable people to get the deposit. Because even, even if you build the houses, you're not going, you are not going to build houses sufficiently fast to actually drive down house prices. And if you did that, that would create another 
uh, problem for us. So what you're really looking at doing is stabilizing house prices. Um, you're still going to need people to be able to get a deposit to get on the housing ladder. So it's both building more houses and dealing with the finance for younger people to be able to put a deposit together without needing a legacy from another member of the family, which is not obviously not a very equitable way of allowing people to, to, to build houses. Surely um, one of the big solutions is to start opening up a bit more of the green belt for development. It seems that, uh, I mean, people have been, you know, prime ministers going right the way back to David Cameron and opposition leaders have been talking about things like building on brownfield lands and reducing land banking, which I see as a policy that Rishi is pushing. But that doesn't seem to have made the difference. I mean, with I think with three and a half million housing units short, of where we ought to be to meet the EU average for housing units per capita. And we need, it seems like a big bang and it doesn't really feel like this poli that Rishi's policies will do that. It feels like it's nibbling around the edges a bit rather than really changing things. Well, on your point about a big bang, I think people also have to be realistic. If you suddenly freed up vast amounts of, of ha uh, house building land, we simply don't have a construction sector actually that could do a, a big bang building approach uh, at all actually. So I think what you need to do is you need to scale up house building and obviously we had a commitment in our manifesto to get to 300,000 uh, houses being built every year um, and I think that was a promise that we ought to try and stick to. The Prime Minister, current Prime Minister, I think sort of unpromised it um, and I think we probably need to try and stick to it. But trying to go much further than that, I think, will be a bit of a challenge with the construction industry and what we can build. Except, again, this comes back to technology. One of the things that Rishi has talked about is about using modular housing and doing what a lot of countries do more than we do, which is effectively building a lot of the housing in a factory hmm. and then dropping it onto a site. So you have to do all the prep under the ground stuff on the site but you effectively drop the finished house, uh, finished house, the shell of a house, and then finish it off on site. And there's quite a bit of evidence that that's a very efficient way of building high quality houses um, in, in a way that they do in other countries. And I think we could learn a bit from that about how to move and use technology to speed up house building, given the uh, resources that we have in the construction industry. We also need to boost skills. And this comes back to his point about investing in people, innovation and capital. I've got a very good example in my constituency, co-funded by the government and a local building firm of an apprenticeship centre to drive a larger volume of highly skilled apprentices into the construction industry. Uh, massive demand from, from all of their industry partners. There's a real shortage of people going into that industry. So actually, it's one of the things we need to do. It's not just the building more houses, it's actually getting more young, young people trained and older people trained to go into the sector to actually build the houses that we need to do for the next generation. Mm. Yes, uh, and uh, it's, housing is obviously one of the biggest, if not the biggest cost of living for most families in Britain. What, uh, leaving housing aside, what would you see as being the two or three biggest or best free market policies that Rishi is suggesting that could really help improve the cost of living for people? So just coming back to that one about housing, it is a big cost. It's another reason, by the way, why you've got to be very careful not to relax fiscal policy too much, mm -hmm. uh, because if you do that, the Bank of England, we've already seen a, a, a sizable increase in interest rates last week. But if you relax fiscal policy too much with unfunded, sizable tax cuts, and what will happen is the Bank of England will tighten monetary policy more, which will drive up interest rates. Welcome for people who've got savings, not welcome for people who've got to pay a mortgage or not welcome for people who rent. Because if you put up interest rates, that put up, puts up the cost of capital for landlords who will pass that on the next time they put up people's rent. So actually, that's a really important thing to keep um, costs down. Uh, I think on other areas, it's about making sure markets work um, mm. properly. So there's a big job of work, I think, to do on energy prices. We're not going to do that in the short term, but I think medium term, it's about trying to drive uh, more capacity in the energy sector. So he's been very clear about getting more nuclear, both traditional builds, but also using small modular reactors 
uh, which is a British success story through Rolls-Royce about trying to do that. More renewables because they're actually cheaper and getting a, a more domestic production of oil and gas to take us through that transition period to get to net zero. That's really important because actually energy bills are now a very, very significant cost for families. Mm. And it's by increasing capacity, particularly domestic capacity, that we can, uh, that we can deliver that. Um, I think the other thing I'd say on that is we're going to have to remain very resolute over the winter uh, because I think Putin is going to use gas and energy prices and supply over the winter to try and force us off of the path that we're on in supporting Ukraine. That is going to be very difficult. We need to be honest with people that there are going to be some challenges there. If we are going to keep a free country and we are going to stand up against dictators like Putin, because if he's successful in Ukraine, he will come after other countries, some of which are in NATO, which would put us in a, in a very difficult position. So I think that battle in Ukraine, where we've effectively got Ukrainians fighting a fight, but effectively they're not just fighting it for themselves, they're fighting it for us to help keep us free. Mm. So members' ballots are dropping on doorsteps as we speak. Unfortunately, mine hasn't turned up yet, but I'm hoping it's, uh, hoping it's in the post. Uh, what would be your closing pitch to any Conservative Party members watching on the case for Rishi Sunak? I'd say two things. I'd say, first of all, he was somebody, he is the change candidate. He's about restoring trust in government. He's the candidate who, when there was lots of pressure being put on him as a new member of parliament, did what he thought was right and voted for Brexit. It's something he believes in and he's going to use the freedoms and opportunities, which, for example, he is delivering, had, had been delivering when he was chancellor to free up our financial services system so that it can invest in British companies rather than having to put all the money into bonds. So a man that can take the uh, get the benefit out of Brexit. Uh, and I'd also say if we're going to put any of our free market principles into action, we've got to win an election. Mm. And at the next election, we're going to be asking for a fifth consecutive term. And if you look at the polls of voters, which are, are critically important, amongst those voters who voted for us and gave us our significant majority, but who currently aren't planning on voting for us, they favour Rishi Sunak by a margin over Liz Trust by a 20 point margin, according to the YouGov poll of uh, those swing voters. And if we don't win them back, we are not going to be in government. And you can have all the free market principles you like, but if Keir Starmer is in Downing Street, propped up by the SNP and the Liberal Democrats, we won't be seeing any of them in practice. So it's mm. vote for somebody with free market principles, but who can actually win an election and put them into practice. Mark, thank you ever so much for joining me to put the case for Rishi Sunak. For those of you watching, the CounterPoint video is also available on the IEA's YouTube channel and the Free Market Forum website, with Greg Smith, MP, putting the case for Liz Truss. If you would like to see more content of this nature, please consider donating to the IEA's Patreon page, which we will be linking to in the description below. And don't forget to like and subscribe our YouTube channel. Thank you very much. Well, if you enjoyed that conversation, why not watch one of these other videos? And while you're here, remember to hit the subscribe button and the notification bell. That way, you'll never miss out on a single IEA broadcast.